Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci Online and a special welcome to those joining us for the first time. It's still uncertain when it would be sensible to resume live meetings, so we're scheduling online events at least until the end of 2021. Your thoughts on a return to live events are welcomed. A recording of this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel where you'll find recordings of all our online talks. I'll put details in the chat. You can also find the links on our website, uh, wincafeside.org.uk. If you enjoyed tonight's talk and you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up for it there to be notified about future talks. After tonight's talk, we'll take a break for a few minutes before the Q&A, so please put your questions into the chat and I'll read them out. That includes our viewers on YouTube. Tonight's speaker is an award-winning academic, highly acclaimed author and much sought after social commentator based in Oxford University in the UK, where he holds the position of Holford Mackinder Professor of Geography. Prolific writer and public speaker, he's published 18 books focusing largely on social inequality in the UK and is frequently called on for his expertise as a social geographer by the UK media and government organisations. He's also published nearly a dozen atlases showcasing his talent for data visualisation. In tonight's talk, he brings these two disciplines together using an adaptation of phase portrait graphs to complement his analysis. Described as that rare university professor, expert, politically engaged and able to explain simply why his subject matters by the Guardian newspaper, his ability to build extraordinary pictures from clouds of ordinary data is equally a delight and an education. To find out more about his work, you can visit his homepage where links to his open access books and data can also be found. To find out more about his favourite hobby, you can also check out his Sandcastle page. Please welcome Professor Danny Dorling. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And thank you for uh, having me this evening. I'm going to show you some pictures for about half an hour. I'll talk to you for about half an hour. And uh, I'm much more interested in uh, your questions than in these, these pictures. Uh, I'm also very happy to talk about inequality in Britain, the pandemic, uh, other things apart from this particular book. But the book I'm going to talk to you about is called Slow Down. It was uh, finished in January 2020. And if you can think all the way back to January 2020, you'll remember that at that point we had no idea a pandemic was coming. And if I'd have known, um, maybe I'd have made a bigger thing out of it, but I think it's quite good I, I didn't. Uh, the claim of the book, the claim of the book Slow Down, is that we're actually in a period of general uh, deceleration things are not going faster and faster and faster despite the fact that we're often told that's what they're uh, doing they're in general slowing down I'll show you what I mean by things in a, in a minute and the reason I'm saying this is that I looked at a whole series of data sets data about people of high enough quality worldwide to be able to work out the rate of change and I was hoping to tell a story about what was speeding up and what was slowing down. Uh, but what I found was that far more things were slowing down than were speeding up. Here's some uh, blurb if you want to read that. And there's the uh, cover of the hardback of, of the book in green with a nice little lounge chair, giving you an impression of, of slowing down. Uh, the other thing I want to argue is, is that this is generally good news. We tend to talk about bad news at the moment. If you I guess most of you do watch the news quite a lot. It's about the climate catastrophe, how everything is, is going to get worse or is getting worse, how we have to fear for the future. Uh, but by looking at trends in the way I have chosen to do it, uh, I was cheered up in a way. Things were a lot less depressing than they might otherwise have been. So I'm going to try and cheer you up this evening if you're uh, pessimistic about the future uh, of the planet uh, or of Britain or, or whatever. Let's click forward. Oh, and there's a sandcastle for you. Um, I can even tell you how to make those sandcastles if you like. Um, you really do need to have the kind of sand we have in Britain. One great advantage of being a, a human geographer is I get to travel around the world. And uh, other countries are very nice, but they tend not to have the kind of muddy sand that we have that lets you produce those sandcastles, and they take a long time. 
Anyway, back to the main subject. Slow down the end of the great acceleration and why it's a good thing. The kind of graphs you may be used to seeing about change uh, are graphs like this. This is the standard or three of the standard graphs of human population. Uh, I think they're called hockey stick graphs. You see population rising very, very slowly over a millennia and then absolutely shooting up in the last six or seven generations out of control up to, what was it, 7.7 .7 billion just before the pandemic hit worldwide. Uh, out of control, you know, we, we just don't know what's going to happen next. What I want to try and convince you is that it looks like that because that is the way in which it has been drawn. But if you draw it and many other things in a slightly different way, you don't just get a different impression, you get almost completely the opposite impression. You don't get the impression that you see here of out of control acceleration. You actually get the impression of truly remarkable deceleration. So that, that's my job to try and convince you of, of that. And then we can talk about some of the implications of it. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about population, but I measure a lot of other uh, things as well. Some things are easier to measure than others. Um, and this kind of worrying about world population, it, it's common. This quote, I, I was very proud of finding this quote years ago from 2007 from Boris Johnson. And then really annoyingly, lots of people have used the quote since. Um, this is Boris worrying about how many people are going in the world and why aren't we talking about it and how to control the number of people in the world now. Tell me is back in 2007, before he personally helped add and I've forgotten how many more children he might have added to the population. I'm not sure who knows. But anyway, there's your quote uh, from Boris about the out of control rise in, in people in the world. Phase diagrams. If you're going to understand uh, the couple of dozen graphs I'm going to show you, you need to understand this kind of graph. Uh, this graph is for a made up country. It's a country that um, by the year 2010 has over 300 million people, by the year 2020 has over four, has 400 million people. The number of people in the country are shown on the y-axis, the vertical axis. That little red dot just keeps moving to give you an idea of the change. And on the horizontal axis, you've got how many extra people are being added each year. And because you've got a constant rate of growth here, 2% more people being added every year, you actually get an increasing absolute number of people because 2% 2 of 200 million is, is an extra 4 million people, 2% of 400 million is an extra 8 million people. On the graph, that constant growth of 2% produces a vertical line. And you'll also see that uh, the dots grow bigger, giving you an idea that the population is growing bigger, and they become slightly more spaced out, further spaced out over time as that growth becomes bigger in absolute terms, but not in relative terms. So there's an imaginary country with 2% growth going from 100 million people in 1950 to 400 million people just 70 years later. That's out of control growth, but not actually an acceleration. It's the same percentage all the time. Now let's look at a country with uh, a declining rate of growth. How does that look? If we start in 1950, again with 2% growth, but we have that growth falling. Uh, before I do that, uh, the irony in all of this is that Charles Darwin, when he was writing The Origin of Species, talked about occasions when species had a few favorable seasons and suddenly exploded in numbers. And the irony is that this is what actually happened to his own species at about the time he was writing. Um, but it doesn't carry on and on and on. It's just a few favorable seasons. Here's the opposite or one of the opposite kind of graphs. Again, starting in 1950 with 100 million people. Uh, but that growth of 2% in 1950 drops to 1.9% by 1951, 1.8% 1 by 1952. By 1970, it's 0% growth. It's reached about 120 million people. Then it falls by a tenth of a percent, by two tenths, by three tenths, by four tenths, and so on. And if that were to happen to this country, then by the year 2070, 
you're down to your last single individual and that's the end of people in that country with no migration and so on you can't reproduce with one person and it produces quite a nice shaped curve if you like that's the if, if you've read the book or seen the film the children of men i think it's pg james could be wrong on that that's the kind of disaster of if we couldn't reproduce anymore what would it look like so there's deceleration you've seen increase and you've seen deceleration and i'm going to show you some actual data from different data sets so i'll get on the population in a minute but i'll show you some other ones first uh, because in slowdown I claim somebody emailed me today, a journalist emailed me today and said, did you really look at thousands of data sets? And the truth was, I'm very sad. I spent six years doing this book and I did. It depends what you call a separate data set. But I looked at many, many, many things um, because it's not that hard. When you're looking at a, a trend over time, you, you, your data set isn't that big compared to a geographical data set. You only have data for each point in time. It's a one dimensional data set. What you're seeing here is data from the United States on the amount of money being borrowed by university students every quarter, four times a year, uh, to go to university. And it's rising all the time. That dot's going up and up and up. It's, it's increasing. It's uh, what, by 2018, it was almost 1.6, uh, oh no, 1.6, trillion i think it's huge i should i should no anyway enormous amounts of money american students are borrowing to go to university but this way of drawing it shows you the subtle change when does the subtle change occur and if i was standing uh physically in front of you i'll be waving my arms now uh, and gesticulating uh to say look you can see it's going at one particular angle between 2006 and 2009 quite sharply going off to the right. But then it suddenly changes. There's a financial crash in 2008. And it's actually leaning the other way. It's leaning towards the right. Not very sharply, but it's, it's definitely going that way, implying a kind of still increasing but decelerating. And so that this increase in student debt in the United States every year is at some point going to come, come to an end if it goes on leaning to the right. You may be wondering why does it go up every year, mainly in October the most. That's when the new students turn up at the US and they want to borrow their money to go to university. That's where you get those little bumps every October. So that's a phase uh, space diagram. And it allows you to really concentrate on the changes in the rate of change. Because when you've got good quality data, it's the change in the rate of change that matters. The only clever thing I've done in this whole book is work out the rate of change at any one point from the period before to the period after. And that completely alters the diagrams. It makes everything much smoother and it makes it all much clearer. So you don't try to measure how fast something's moving at exactly the point you're measuring it. You take the period before, in this case, the quarter before and the quarter after, take one away from the other, uh, divide it by two because you've got two quarters and that gives you your rate of change. So there's US debt. Let's look at something else, Wikipedia. Um, I did a lot of looking at the size of the internet, how much data there was and so on, because it's something that people like to say is exploding exponentially, but it isn't. Uh, it was at first, uh, almost everything when it first begins goes rises exponentially. Wikipedia was created around about 2001. The number of entries increased more each year than the year before. Uh, you know, it's 2004, 2005, and so on. But by 2007, that acceleration had ended. You still have people, mainly men, um, adding entries to Wikipedia, but they weren't managing to add more every year than the year before. And the reason when you think about it is, is rather obvious. Wikipedia is an encyclopedia. It's the biggest encyclopedia we've ever had in the world. Uh, but there's a limit to how many things even in Wikipedia you want to find out about. And there comes a point when people just don't add more things that won't be looked at. And the things that are most likely to be looked at have already been written about. Little blip in 2015, that acceleration again, was when they added a thing called stubs. Um, but you wouldn't look for that unless you saw this graph and you see the graph and you go, what happened then? And you Google, what's happened to Wikipedia in 2015? And it says stubs were created. So there's a kind of more obvious deceleration. 
but you can find the same with volumes of data on the internet. To put it really crudely, there's only so many selfies that teenagers can take of themselves. There is actually a limit. It doesn't carry on accelerating forever. Some things are accelerating. In fact, there are four. Out of all the things I measured, uh, there are four things that are not just going up, but accelerating. And uh, this is one of them. This is carbon emissions per year. It's one estimate of carbon emissions. And you can see by 2018, we're looking at about 37, 38 billion tonnes a year. There's a report on the BBC tonight, I think, which had now got it over 40 uh, billion tonnes in the run up to the COP meeting in Glasgow. All the detail is about the change. All the interesting thing is, is when is it accelerating? When is it decelerating? And when this little dot goes back to 1960, you can see it was going up and going up faster then. But then we had the oil shock in 1974, actually went down. We had a global recession in the early 1980s. It went down. We had a little recession in the early 1990s. Bad news if you were age 20 then. Um, I've forgotten quite what happened in 1998, dot com maybe. Uh, recession in 2008, but that didn't manage to slow things uh, down completely. We have all these agreements. You'll see the little symbols on there for the Rio Earth Summit, Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and we'll be able to add Glasgow to that soon. But the sad thing is, and too few data points to, 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 to make a big claim about this, but it's it does look a bit as if we have one of these summit, summits, think we've done something about it, and actually there's acceleration after the summit uh, rather than before it, but I think that's mainly just chance. But there's an example of something accelerating. It's leading to the right. Now, at this point, people normally think, oh, can't you just show me a normal graph and I can work this out from a normal graph. I don't need your weird graph to do it. So let me show you a normal graph. That's the normal graph. And of course, normal graphs are fairly useful. We'd have given up with them if they weren't, but they really hide the subtle changes. Looking at that graph, you're just seeing the thing in general going up. You're not noticing the times when the actual amount of emissions per year fell one year after another. And that matters because you need to know it's possible for it to fall. You know, it actually fell during the sessions uh, before. You need to have, have a sense, I think you need a sense, and certainly young people need to have a sense that this does not have to inexorably rise forever and ever, and it hasn't. And that normal way of, of depicting it doesn't let you look at those particular changes or say, oh, look, after the year 2000, we can see the rate of change really going up. I pointed it out and you can now. It was in the 10 years after the year 2000 that the climate skeptics went quiet. If you can remember the debates there were before then, we just had so many hot summers after then that, that it, it slowed down. Let's go back to these graphs again. Here's the second thing. Uh, that is not just rising but accelerating in the world and its temperature and there are lots of different temperature series and it's much harder measuring temperature than it is measuring carbon uh, for carbon you just have to uh, measure it in an observatory in Hawaii every year somewhere away from point sources of, of pollution and you and you see it kind of going up and there's emissions can be done in other ways uh, but temperature is trickier because it tends to be averaged from, from thousands and millions of observations. But as you see that little dot moving around and circulating around, not doing very much, all the way through to 1945, you get a sense with temperature that it really, really was the period since the Second World War where we've seen this acceleration in temperature. And again, if you look very carefully, you can see the early, or slightly after, the early 1980s recession, it's 83 is when we don't see much of a rise. Uh, and again, the 90s recession, and again, 2008, 2009, the global economic crash. Um, so temperature doesn't always rise linearly, uh, and it is directly related to, to amount of carbon and other greenhouse gases. So that's your second thing that's accelerating. What isn't accelerating? people and this is not news this is really an old story now um it was news in the 1970s and 80s uh, for, for 
those of you who are older than my father in the audience, you may well, well, my dad can just about remember it, but he was becoming a father at the time. Uh, remember the book, The Population Bomb, published in 1968. The Population Bomb was about how we were going to be overrun with people, how we really shouldn't be sending money to poor countries because it would only encourage people to have babies, how the world was going to end in a kind of huge seething mass of, of human bodies. And if you look at the 1960s and 1968, you, you can see that then we were adding more people every year. It was out of control ac acceleration. But something happened in the 1970s and 1980s and it's the 1990s that, that really brought this acceleration to a halt. You still had growth, but suddenly the growth was not growing bigger every year as compared to the year before. It was growing at around about a steady 80, 85 additional million people per year until about a year ago. And then the increase in global population begins to slow and the projections and for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we can do the projections pretty well because they're based on us and we've got a fairly good idea how long we're going to live for. And they're based on how many babies we have and we have a fairly good idea about how many of those we're going to have at least the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We can see there's a great deceleration coming our way. And this is largely not uh, disputed. I, I was hedging my bets for about 10, 20, 30, 40 years ahead because you go much further than that and you go to the year 2100 and you'll find that the UN estimates actually differ by a billion or two billion between different iterations. We do not know just 79 years from now whether there'll be eight people, eight billion people, nine billion, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 billion on the planet. I think there'll probably be about nine. I'm an optimist. Uh, this projection uh, suggests that there'll be about 11, but this projection is actually the one made in 2017, and the one they did in 2019 was lower than this, and the one they'll be doing now, I suspect, will be lower again, because fertility is lower. COVID, and I'll try not to mention COVID too much, but COVID has almost zero effect on this whatsoever. Um, four or five million deaths and you don't want to underplay it but four or five million deaths in two years in the world out of a normal total of 120 million people who normally die in those two years is small it's in the error um and i won't i'm sure it'll come up in discussion and so on the, the the other possible effects of the pandemic on these things but in general and in the slowdown book i wrote a lot about pandemics which i'm now glad i did in general, in the past, for at least for the past 200 years, pandemics have been blips, uh, hardly noticeable in their effect. 1889 to 1894, the Russian flu pandemic, you won't have heard of it or remember it. The big flu pandemic, 1918, 1919, world GDP fell by, I think it was 16%, and the next year rose by 14%, had almost no effect. Uh, there was a small European war, which we like to call the First World War because we're very important, but it wasn't a world war, it was largely European. After that, you have the 1957 pandemic, the 1968 pandemic. You don't remember these either uh, because the effects are so small in terms of GDP, in terms of population. This one may be differently, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, there's just so done. Okay, look at that same graph a slightly different way, slightly more complicated way now, uh, on a log scale. And the reason for doing this on a log scale is it really lets you concentrate about change. And we can go back 2000 years and actually get the early data in, very, very rough data, this is Angus Madison's estimates. And you can see that there's been slowdowns in world population before, world human population. We're a really, really young species, by the way. You know, only 100,000 years old or so in our current state is an incredibly new species. We have a slowdown after 1492, when we turn up in the Americas with our, our germs. Uh, didn't actually get a reduction in world population, but millions and millions died in the Americas. So you have that slowdown from 1492 to 1600. You have a slowdown that's 
almost equivalent in size from 1820 to 1850. And I think that's the peak of the British Empire and colonialism and the slave trade. Um, and a time when I think it's former Prime Minister Gordon Brown said, we invaded, uninvited, I think it's 173 of the current 193 members of the UN. That's just us, but you know, don't feel too guilty. Other European countries were doing this as well, but the disruption that occurred in the planet from 1820 to 1850 slowed the normal growth of populations worldwide, not in Europe, which were absolutely ballooning at the time, but then disrupted things so much that they help fuel the acceleration again that comes afterwards. And this all matters for debates about population and climate change and so on, because if you want to blame other countries for things, you have to remember, and I think I've got to graph later, what we were doing in places like China in these years, how we were supporting free trade by insisting that they buy our opium from India. And the effects of, on that on, on China were uh, truly devastating. And it wasn't, you know, China wasn't even part of the British Empire. Anyway, and there you see the slowdown that we're currently just starting. And what's nice about the slowdown that we're currently just starting is that it's the first one that isn't the result of taking our germs from the old world to the new world or completely disrupting social systems that had formed for centuries or millennia in the case of Australia. <laughs> this one is all about women having control of the choice over their bodies and how many children they actually have and contraception and security and not thinking you have to have more children to look after you in old age and so on and so on and so on. And this one is not set to end. And this is where you can get into arguments with, with people who want to go into space. You go, no, it's going to end. We've got to go into space and so on. Um, space takes ages to get to. But let me zoom on so I'm not talking for much more than half an hour. Here's China. Um, there's little opium poppies <laughs> around the time of the opium wars. Just to give you the kind of idea of the disruption that happened to the population then. Here's the acceleration to 1968. You had a generation who had an average of six children per couple, and that fell down to two before the one child policy came in. But the really important stuff is that China peaks very soon, nine years time. Uh, China stops growing in terms of population. We don't, I don't think I've got the graph for Britain, uh, but we carry on for longer. And China is currently projected to be down to a billion in 70, 79 years from now, but very different shaped graph. And you can draw these graphs for every country in the world, and you can draw them for the 2017 UN projections and the 2019, and hopefully soon the 2021, and, and so on. And they, they, I find them fascinating because they have all these particularly different shapes. Here's the entire continent of Africa. Um, different countries in Africa show very, very different patterns. And it is the area of the world with the biggest population rise projected to come. This may well be an overestimate because countries do not follow what other countries did decades before them. They often change much more quickly, but there's Africa heading over up to 4 billion people. Um, and back to a global share of world population it had in 1820, um, before, before we and France and Belgium and the, to a small extent the Germans and the Italians disrupted societies in Africa as much as, as we did. Uh, there's a second great disruption, which was in the 1980s, 1990s, which was the austerity policies of the IMF. And I remember finding a paper just as I was finishing the book, uh, written by people with no particular axe to grind, but we showed that when the IMF took away money from poor countries in Africa, that money was taken away from things like education for secondary schools, which meant that girls couldn't go to secondary schools and was responsible possibly for as many as an extra billion people in future on the planet. Um, but again, a lot of these things are speculation. Let's zoom on from this. Here's India. I'm not going to show you too many of these, but the point is, is just to, to show you, you know, 1960, 1968, it was India in particular that worried the authors of the population bomb. Uh, and they talked about, I think you're standing in Delhi and surrounded by, by millions of people. Uh, population warriors tend to always talk about standing in the middle of the densest city in the world and how terrible it is. Uh, 
they don't talk about standing in the random part of the planet, which if you were to teleport now to a random part of the planet, almost certainly there'd be nobody to see because most of the Earth's surface doesn't have, this is the land surface, doesn't have many people on it at all. Anyway, India peaks in 2064 on the current trajectory that it's going on. GDP. Now here's GDP or with a normal axis, and it makes sense to use a log axis, but I thought I'd first show you with a normal axis. 80s recession, 90s recession, this is world GDP. Uh, very high rates of growth in the early 2000s, but then that crash in 2008. You can see the recovery again to 2010, a bit of a slowdown to 2015, a little bit of a slowdown before we were entering a world economic recession, just before um, March 2020, which very few people remember that. The worries about, oh, the, oh, they're slowing down production in China. We're not sure what's going to happen. Uh, and then bang, we, we get the pandemic. So this thing will move way over negative for a little bit and then up again. But that's on a normal scale. Let's put it on a log, log scale because you should really, with GDP, a doubling should be treated equally. And on a, a log scale, what I think you see, and this is where I'm waving my arms metaphorically because I don't think you can see me, is that from... 1950 through to now, certainly from 1964 through to now, the thing is leaning to the right. Average GDP growth in the world in the 1950s was bigger than the 1960s, which was bigger than the 70s, which was bigger than the 80s, which was bigger than the 90s when you work it out. For each decade, a particular reason is always given. You know, post-war reconstruction and America, American hegemony led to incredible growth in the 50s. The oil shock led to less growth in the 70s, recession in the 80s. But if you step back from all those individual particular stories that you're told, what you see is a slowing down. Um, this is really good news, or at least good news to the planet in a way, because if GDP had accelerated rather than slowed down, if it had lent to the uh, right as much as it's leaning to the left, we really would have burnt the place up by now. It would absolutely be. Uh, too late. Going forward again, here's GDP for China. And even for China, you can see that those incredible rates of growth, as little stalling in 2008, not a huge, but you know, shock for China. But then a peak of growth in 2010 slows down again, manages to get back up in 2017 to that same kind of rise, but was slowing again up to 2019. And China was the biggest growing and still is the biggest growing economy in the world. Just going to show you another dozen uh, graphs before I sort of bring this to, to a, a halt and you can think about questions. It, if you're the way, the kind of the one interesting thing in all of this is, is you've got somebody drawing these graphs who was trying to find things that were speeding up, like this one. This is a NASDAQ and couldn't actually find that many of them. I'm going to show you it's going forward from 1996 in a minute. But you know, up until 1996, if you were investing in the NASDAQ, you'd think you'd found a way to turn base metals into gold, wouldn't you? You know, Look at that growth, it's incredible. This is high tech firms. Um, they're doing incredibly well. You've only got to invest then in 1987. You can double your money by 1994, you're gonna double it again. Uh, you can live the life of Riley. And that's just looking at this one particular stock market index. So let's go forward from 1996. And the reason I'm showing you this is, of course, is to try to show you that these graphs have no predictive ability, right? Just because this thing is accelerating away into the ether in 1996 doesn't mean it's going to do that after 1996. And we zoom out, and there you can see it going up to 1996, different scale. And then we get the dot com crash, which is like an amazing double roller coaster. It goes round and it goes round again inside. It must have been a bit scary if you were in charge of a hedge fund or whatever at the time. And then it zooms up again, stalls a bit in 2015, but accelerates again in 2017. Looks as if it's on the verge of an almighty crash in 2019. And then, because of course, Apple, Facebook, Netflix, whatever, all in this index, it will have just gone up again massively because they're the things you want to invest in at a time when there's a pandemic and people have to go and spend money on high-tech American goods. Um, so you can't, you know, in hindsight, it produces you lovely pictures and summaries of the past, 
but it doesn't tell you what's going to happen in the future. But what it, I think it shows, and here's a nice example, is something which was just not accelerating and accelerating. Uh, and these kind of things really matter. Uh, I'm a university academic, so I'm a member of the Universal Super, University Superannuation Scheme, the largest private pension scheme in Britain. And uh, it's not in good shape, let's put it that way. Uh, so there may be a strike coming this autumn across the universities of Britain because we may on average be losing, I don't know, possibly up to a hundred thousand pounds of future income or whatever. Now, all the arguments about this are all about how this pension scheme, Britain's largest private pension scheme, should be investing in things like this because it would make more growth over the time and it would pay my nice, very nice pension. And other people, including the pension trustees going, we don't trust this anymore. Uh, we want to invest in something very boring, like government guilt, which as they go up by less than inflation, <laughs> aren't going to do the job either. Um, so I just think it's interesting to look at these things in, in a different way to how they're normally looked at. Going forward again, completely different things, just to give you a sense of variety. Uh, and things we now have good or we think we have good data, the average height of adults in the world um, was going up pretty solidly to the 1950s and then begins to slow down and actually goes down slightly for people born from 1978 onwards. Now, all these data series are, are complicated and nuanced. What's actually happened here is no country in the world, as far as I know, has, has seen people shrink. What's happened is the global balance of people in the world has seen a shift towards more people being born in countries where people tend to be shorter, <laughs> put it that way, or are at the moment. Um, but we could draw this uh, graph for the UK, and you could just think about your own children, or nephews and nieces or whatever, and grandchildren. And in the UK, we have a kind of acceleration of height. I go to university graduations for only one purpose, which is to see the average height difference between parents and their children. It's about three or four inches. Um, but that's slowing down. So many, many things are, are slowing down about people. Here's one of the ones that's still accelerating. If you remember, I told you I only found four. They're carbon emissions, global temperature. Here's the third one. This is the proportion of people by one UN measure, UNESCO measure, proportion of the people in the world who are becoming university graduates, which by this measure, I think by the age of 30, was heading towards over a third um, of the population, I think had been in university for one day sometime in their life. Um, but anyway, it's leaning to the right, it's accelerating. But that one, you can tell, that's going to have to slow down. It's got to slow down because you couldn't get to 100% or more than 100% of people going uh, to university. And in a sense, what we've seen with university graduates, is it's like watching a number of secondary school children rising a century ago. It's a new form of mass education worldwide. And it's interesting to see it rise. It's interesting to think about what a change that means for the world, but it's not going to carry on rising at that rate. It cannot carry on rising at that rate forever. Something that's slowing down and might surprise you, surprised me when I first drew it and then it kind of became obvious, is um, the number of species going extinct in the world. And this was accelerating in the 1970s and 1980s and then really slowed down a little bit because we started worrying about species conservation and about not doing things that made species extinct. And these species are the ones that the Zoological Society of London measures. And I think they tend to have a backbone. This is, there are many areas in this book where my expertise is near minimal, but species is one of them. But what actually happened uh, was that we had made extinct the low-hanging low fruit early on. In the 1970s and 1980s, we, often unwittingly, made extinct very rare species on islands around the world, ones which were only hanging on by a thread anyway. There were few of these by the 80s, luckily. And so the rate of extinction slows as there's less to be made extinct, and uh, we begin to care more about not making species extinct, but it still meant that 70% of all these larger species were extinct by the year 2013, once we actually measure. If that hadn't slowed down, it took hit 100% and we'd all be dead. Not just us, the other species. So, you know, initially it looks like a good news story, but then you go, oh, well, maybe it wasn't so good. But you can, you can draw these graphs of almost anything. 
here's the fourth and final acceleration. Uh, and this one really pleased me because, of course, we know it stopped accelerating shortly after 2017. Not in 2018, not in 2019, but boy, did the number of aircraft flights in the world slow down in 2020. So when we finally get the data for 2020 and 2021 on how many people are flying in the world or how many flights, because this is about flights and passengers, not people, um, the large majority of the population of the world have never flown, will never fly. Most people being born now will never fly. Flying is done by affluent people uh, like us from a rich country. And even within a rich country, the majority of people on, say, Ryanair and EasyJet are social class ABC1. So it's, it's a pretty exclusive thing, but it was going out of control. And for the moment, it slowed down dramatically. The real question for me about flights is, to what extent do governments try to prop up their aircraft industry and help it come back? Or to what extent do they let it shrink and become much smaller and much more expensive? And if it's much more expensive and you do things like night trains across Europe, maybe it will never get back up to those kind of levels it was at before. Babies, not much more to go now, I promise you. And I think I've gone uh, just past half an hour these are the most fascinating that there are worldwide baby booms and echoes of baby booms. The first baby boom was in the 1950s, 1950, 51, 52, 53. Uh, part of that, a small part, the minority of that was the post-World War II baby boom when the troops came back, nine months after the troops come back, you get a baby boom. The much bigger part of that was the partition of India, Indian independence, the disruption that that caused Whenever there's disruption, people have more children. And the revolution in China, which caused enormous disruption and people have more children. Uh, in a more stable country and at more stable times, people have fewer children. One of the lowest rates of childbirth in the world at the moment is Finland, about 1.3 babies per couple. It ties with Tokyo, which is about 1.3 babies per couple, very stable places. The less stable you get, and just to try and rile you for asking questions, we're one of the least stable parts of Europe. We may not think we are, but you know, we're the kind of road nation that does things like Brexit and so on. We have the greatest economic inequality in all of Europe, apart from Bulgaria occasionally. And we have relatively high fertility. Um, but fertility re reduces when you're more stable. So sorry, to come back to this graph, worldwide baby boom that really we're only just kind of recognizing was one in the early 1950s. You get a slowdown from the baby slump, which was from before then, and then you get the children of those babies slow down, the grandchildren slow down. And then we get into this situation now of reductions for the foreseeable future at a certain time. And the really interesting thing with UN democratic demographic forecasts is they all tend to end assuming that the world will go stable with an average couple having two children in the world at some point in the future, often by the year 2300. But if you look at the most advanced and stable parts of the world, there's no sign of them going to two children. It's much more like 1.3, maybe 1.5. If the Swedes really try it and you really bung people bribes and money to have babies, you can occasionally get it up to 1.7 or 1.8 for a short amount of time. Um, but that's just something aside to think about. Uh, if people are really free to choose, particularly women who on average want half a child less than the average man, if people are free to choose and their fear of their children being ill can be brought down to near minimal, so you're not worrying about whether they'll survive you, one child often becomes the norm. Two children is a little bit unusual. Three is profligate. Um, and when one child becomes the norm in those cities like Barcelona, Barcelona, Hong Kong, you know, whole series of them where more children are only children than two children, it's much easier just to have one child. In fact, it becomes quite hard to have more than one because other people have one. They go, oh, why do you have two? You're going to need another bedroom. How are you going to do that? So that's babies. Zooming on. Life expectancy. There are only about five graphs left. I do apologize for having thrown all these graphs at you. Hot summer's evening. 
Life expectancy, the increases in it were largely about infant mortality falling in the past. Once infant mortality has been brought very low in most of the world, it doesn't rise much more. Uh, the official estimates have a ridiculous rise forecast in them. I don't think that's likely, but anyway, even with those, you're not looking at the kind of increases of the past. Um, I showed these slides last in Scotland, so I put this in for the Scots, uh, which is just a BBC graph about deaths, which I'll leave out for now. Just to, one thing to point out about it, these are the previous world wars and the Russian flu. Um, in the years before the pandemic hit, we had a series of years in which unusually high numbers of people died. And if you were to add up all those little bars beforehand, they actually get longer than the bar for COVID. These are the deaths that are normally associated with austerity. And we tend not to notice them. That's why I put that in, but it's a separate topic. I think we're almost at my last slide of real data yet, which is a weird one. It, it's about Tokyo. And the reason for including this is to remind me to tell you that I didn't invent this kind of way of drawing graphs. This way of drawing graphs was invented by physicists and mathematicians. It's only about 200 years old, but that's where it comes from. And I didn't even inv invent this way of drawing graphs for social science data, because that was invented in the 1970s in Japan by Japanese social scientists. And they used this way of drawing graphs to look at things like the growth of the suburbs and the growth of the inner city in Tokyo to see which was growing faster, which was growing smaller. And you'll see it spirals in towards the middle and that's because Tokyo began to settle down. Neither the suburbs nor the middle grew. It had hit 30 million people. It didn't need to change. It was becoming stable. And to spoil the book slightly, if any of you do get to read it, the, the fascinating coincidence, the Japanese academic in the 1970s who discovered this way of looking at social science data he had a daughter who liked looking at social change and she went off to university to do a master's in social change. And she actually met a young man who was doing a master's in catfish and biology and he wanted to marry her. So they did, but it was a slightly complicated marriage because the young man was the grandson of the emperor. This is a true story. And so the Royal Chamberlain had to turn up with gifts at the academic's house, which were too large to actually fit in in the house. Why am I telling you this story apart from my envy that some academics get to marry into the royal family? Uh, the reason for, for telling you this story is that the things we can measure are often slowing down, but things you can't measure or which are harder to measure, such as social change in Japan, can be accelerating at the same time as you're getting a slowdown. Why was this an incredible acceleration? It was the first time, I think in 3000 years, that the Japanese royal family had married a commoner. And that's a big thing. Um, and in fact, because of the way things went in the Japanese royal family, because nobody else appeared to have a baby, uh, that young boy is going to become the next emperor whose granddad invented this kind of way of drawing graphs. Mm -hmm. so, so what I try and do at the end of the book is sort of say, just because the things we are measure are slowing down doesn't mean that other aspects of society are going to slow down it's just it's often the things that we don't count those kind of changes which are speeding up uh, here's your traditional picture of a phase portrait if you're thinking i've seen this kind of thing somewhere before it's classically used to describe the movement of a slowing pendulum so there's your pendulum slowing and on one axis here you've got uh, the position of the pendulum and the other you've got its velocity how fast it's moving and it forms the perfect spiral is what you're actually seeing the miraculous spiral I think it's the kind of spiral that's used by a kestrel when it comes down and gets its prey um, so that's where these graphs come from they're for looking at things like the slowing down of a pendulum and some sandcastles to end with for you uh, I also talk in the book, although this is where the data is weakest, about the slowing pace of technological change. Uh, when I was young, we were promised jetpacks, teleporting, all those things on Star Trek. Uh, they didn't really come around. 
all the things that my grandfather was promised in his H.G. Wells science fiction did come around. Um, we tend to always talk, and particularly in universities, we talk about the accelerating pace of discovery and invention, and that's partly because we get paid all my government if we claim we're doing this. Um, but whenever you kind of try and measure the rate of in invention and so on, you tend to find that the 1930s were highest. The, the last of the big inventions from electricity were being made, the beginnings of, of computing and so on. And as you come forward in time, the inventions are less and less impressive. So I first saw something like what I'm looking like now, a screen with some of you on and me on and so on, in the very late 1980s, early 1990s. I got email at university in the late 1980s. I got a mobile phone in the 1990s. It's not changing as fast as before. And the argument being, because many of the things uh, that were there to be inventive electricity and so on have actually already been invented. I'm going to stop sharing now and hopefully I've come back uh, to all of you. And this is the point at which I found out whether you could hear me throughout all that or whether I talk <laughs> to myself. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much indeed. That's been fascinating. Um, I'm thinking that we might just keep going um, as we're a sort of an intimate crowd tonight. Um, if anybody wants to head away or come, uh, take a break, then you know, they're, they're free to do so. I can still see some hands clapping in the background, which is excellent. Um, you, you can turn your, your microphones back on now if you want to. Um, cool, so unless you, unless you want to take a break, for this stage, Danny, if you're I'm okay. fine, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah okay. And, and it's good because the only t working toilet in my house is the one behind me. So, so we mustn't go on too long because my children at some, at some point will need to use it. <laughs> so it's fine. fine not to think about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, um, we, we've only got a few of the noisy ones in tonight. I was, I was hoping Mike Biden might have been along because he has a particular bit in his bondage about population and I would have like to have seen some of his yeah. arguments demolished, but hey. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, in, I was quite intrigued with the bit about the, the temperature rise only becoming visible um, from 1978. Yes. Yes. So, I, I, I pick, I've read the bit in your book that was saying that if you're 60, 70, 75% of the heating has happened in your lifetime. And I thought, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so it, we, it was sort of, it's kind of deniable for some of that time, I guess. Yes. Oh, yes, it, it definitely would have been. And it's, we reconstruct the history. So, so we, we find a few people who spotted this early on and uh, talk about what a good job they did, but they didn't do that good a job. Um, not least when I was doing my geography A-level in 1986, I was being taught about global cooling mm. uh, and the cooling that I should expect them to get my A-level grade. I had to talk about how the planet was getting colder and geographers were climbing up mountains and measuring glaciers to see how fast they were coming down. Now, and how the problem is, and this is, uh, you were cordial, so I'll try to be too rude about my colleagues. <laughs> For many years, they thought they were just making mistakes. And they did quite like having their summer climb up the Alps. And it took them some time to actually realise they weren't making a mistake. And these glasses were actually going backwards. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we like to go back to the earliest studies of that, but it really wasn't until the 1990s uh, that the glaciers were noticed to be truly going backwards. Um, and there was a lot of uh, debate because, you know, well, you've seen from COVID, a, a wonderful example of scientists arguing for each other, you know, and really good scientists. These are epidemiologists, so they're better than your average scientist, but arguing with each other. Or go early, if you go to 2008, you can think about all the economists arguing with each other about 2008. You know, they said it couldn't happen and then they crashed. Mm. Um, so climate change was, was certainly disputable in the 90s, I would say, although some of my colleagues would be angry with me for saying that. But, and if you look at some of the animations that people have produced, it's, that, it's those summers since two, the year 2000, where it just really just goes off the scale, continuously, 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 at which point you go, yes, something, something 
really big is happening, even if you're skeptical about it. Um, but before, you know, we had, and the data goes, goes back to the 19th century, uh, we had periods of, cool, of cooling, uh, of below the kind of global, global norm. So, so what you can say optimistically from this, I think, is that we're not an incredibly stupid species. This wasn't obvious for decades and decades and decades and decades. It's only been really in the last 20 or 30 years that it's been very obvious. Um, and the idea that we're not going to do something about it, I, I don't think that's too uh, credible. And in the book, um, the analogy I do is with nuclear weapons. You know, there were a small number of people even before nuclear weapons were invented in the 30s when it when it became including Einstein you know who said this is a very bad idea don't do this and then there were a series of hippies in the 1950s and more hippies in the 1960s uh, saying how terrible it would be but the consensus was this is sensible it's just another weapon and it wasn't until Thatcher and Reagan that we got the beginnings of really serious disarmament um, and we've got rid of 90% of the world's nuclear warheads. The 10% left are still far too many and very dangerous. But, you know, if you can do that with a weapon, and I don't think human beings have done this with a weapon before, uh, I, I wouldn't be completely pessimistic about climate change. Uh, mm. I'm hoping we're going to see some more people chiming in with some questions in the chat. They've been remarkably silent, on, uh, mean to, including people, on, uh, people in... Uh, watching on YouTube can put comment questions in the chat as well. But, um, what, one of the things that um, I've noticed today, actually, uh, talking um, that seemed to sort of jar slightly with what you were saying about um, the, expect, the expectation of uh, future birth rate or in, in the near future, um, talking about a surge in people of college age as, as part of the sort of natural demographic cycle, seems yeah. to be the, the suggestion. Um, but that doesn't seem to be feeding into a, a series of consequent bul uh, bul population bulges in, in your projection. Yeah, that, that's, just, that's just for this country. That's so most of what I'm projecting worldwide. Right. Uh, for the UK, we currently have a little acceleration of 18 year olds. Um, born around 2003-2004. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wish I'd put up the UK graph actually because the UK graph is, is quite fascinating. Um, the biggest slowdown and it is, it's UK and Ireland because of course until Ireland won its independence it was part of the UK. The biggest slowdown was the famine in Ireland yeah. in the 1840s. The biggest acceleration was 2003-4567 Eastern European immigration. Um, and it's not something I shouted about much <laughs> in recent years, but it really was uh, quite big. And, and that will have involved some people having children because it's young adults. And, you know, thankfully for universities, they're of university age. But, but that's a blip. That's a temporary thing that came. And, and that's only we only had so much uh, migration because we were one of what was it three or four countries that opened up and the others were all small. Um, so we got the really get up and go clever builders to stereotype and first <laughs> and so on. But, you know, that, that was a short term thing that happened. And then when the rest of Europe opened up to Eastern European A8 migration, uh, the immigration from the rest from those countries reduced. Uh, but but you see that in, in the births. OK, um, Johnny has a question. Do you want to um, ask your question, Johnny? He's still there. Oh, he's got the mic though. He says, thanks for the fantastic talk, Danny. I think I'm right in thinking that China's GDP growth has been slowing down for a while. Is this the same with the growth in their emissions as also slowing down? Uh, the GDP growth definitely been slowing for, for a while. Um, it's um, still growing, but slowing, you know, so for them, 6% annual growth is very slow. For us, it would be an unbelievable miracle as far as our chancellors would be concerned. Mm. Um, and it's partly slowing because, of course, 
there isn't an acceleration in people to sell fridges to in the countries that, again, sorry to stereotype, you can only sort of think about these things in terms of concrete objects. Putting fridges on boats and sending those, those boats to, to the West can't keep on growing at 6% because there's a limit to how many fridges people need and, and the Chinese being nice people make fridges that last for some time <laughs> to do that. Uh, emissions, a lot of coal in China. Um, I think this is where things will probably get heated in Glasgow in a couple of months time, because it all depends on how you measure it. If you measure emissions per person, China looks pretty low. If you measure emissions for the country as a whole, it's the highest emitter in the world. If you measure emissions from China, having subtracted the carbon that in effect comes to the West in the form of that fridge and all the energy used to make that fridge, the emissions for China look low again and the emissions for us look much higher. You know, we like to boast about how we've had a fall in our emissions because we switched to gas rather than coal. But at the same time, we've switched to importing almost everything of bulk that we need and we import that from a place whose energy is produced by coal. Um, so, it, you know, I think we're going to, I don't know, being pessimistic, I think we'll see a kind of to and fro Cold War three kind of China West argument thing about this, which in a sense it was could all be a bit silly uh, because the rest of the world that isn't Europe, China or North America isn't producing hardly any emissions, is suffering the most from climate change. And, it, and if you did have this argument between China, Europe and the US, it, it, it would it would be a bit unfortunate. Mm. I saw an interesting statistic from the National Grid recently where they were talking about uh, whether the grid or how well prepared the grid was for things like electric vehicles. Um, some people say, oh, the grid will never cope. And they were saying that the peak demand ever recorded on the grid was something like 62 gigawatts. Mm. And that was about 20 years ago. Yeah, and it sort of tends to average about thirty to forty at the moment. Yeah, that's much better. We we've, we've got much more efficient heating systems. We're putting, um, you know, insulation into our houses so that if those houses, if you're lucky enough to be heated by underfloor electric heating or heat pumps or something, uh, you need less. Uh, but on on the peak, it was always it was the break on. I think it was East Enders. I think it, might, it wasn't Angie and Den, but it was an only when there used to be 20 or 30 million people watching particular TV programs, you had a real problem running the national grid because they all put the, the, the kettle on at the same time. Now that no longer exists, we've got much flatter uh, demand, uh, which is much easier to deal with. Mm. Yeah. Don, do you want to uh, ask your question? Uh, I, I guess, as usual, it's an odd question that most people can't understand. <laughs> it just seems to me that um, uh, academic awards, things like first degrees, like masters, like PhDs, have become the norm rather than the exception. And I wonder if you can correlate this to the um, uh, global uh, dissemination of, of knowledge across the population of the globe over time. Yes, uh, I think what has happened is, is that the university has become a secondary school, but, but we still, for various reasons, talk about universities as if they are an elite separate thing. So when I went to university, only about 6% of, of people in Britain went to something called a university and about another 4% to a polytechnic, so that's 10% in, in total. Um, uh, I'm from a very affluent family so my parents went and my grandfather went now when he went almost nobody went it was one in ten thousand uh going to university it's not a it's not a devaluation it's a normalizing it, it's similar to when only a few children could go to the grammar school in the town you only had one grammar school often for boys no school for girls at all um this, it's the same kind of thing that's happened with universities the problem is that we won't accept this, uh, particularly in a country like the UK, where we, we have essentially privatised our universities. In 2012, when the £9,000 a year fees came in, 
the government were only putting a billion into universities and billions and billions were coming elsewhere and so universities had to sell themselves on the idea that they are special for a small proportion of the population uh, this degree is going to get you an amazing job and so on because it's a, a private sales job because i'm trying not to shoot my industry too much in the foot um and and the problem is that when I went, when only 10% of people got a degree, uh, you really were pretty well guaranteed to have at least an average life, if not a better than average life economically. Uh, the pandemic, for the first year in the pandemic, we actually saw graduates, new graduates do worse than people who hadn't gone to university uh, because you needed key workers. You didn't need uh, whatever it was that most graduates were, were doing in, in 2020. Um, and then the other part of your question is kind of the grade inflation one. Um, and again, that's, it, it's one that, that the more market orientated a country, the worse it is. So one thing I particularly dislike, because I did a PhD, and I did a PhD at a time when only four of us in the department did it. And you only did a PhD if you're really weird, and you didn't mind losing out on the housing ladder. And that's how it was put. You know, if you do this thing, if you stay at university and you're a PhD student, and nobody knew what a PhD was, if you do a PhD, you will lose out on the housing ladder. You might become an academic. That's not a particularly well-paid job compared to what else you could do. Only do a PhD if you really want to. Whereas what you see now, particularly in the United States, is young people talking about when they're going to get their PhD. Um, you know, as a, just another degree you've kind of purchased from a university. And it's a hell of a shock for them when they find out they've actually got to do something and, you know, write a hundred thousand pound, hundred thousand word dissertation. Uh, but I can moan on it, you know, but that, the problem, the problem is not accepting that universities have become the new secondary school. And if you like sort of selling in a way, in the past, those very old schools would often have pupil teachers and you know one pupil would become a teacher and so on and that's how they operated we wouldn't do that now with secondary schools you wouldn't now take 16 and 17 year olds and say you can be the special pupil teacher it'll be disastrous but in a sense by taking things that universities used to do when they were cliques and small and multiplying them say the number of phds by a hundred or even a thousand times worldwide i think you've potentially created a problem but i may just be getting old and moany uh, but it does worry me. It does. Maybe, maybe it, it does contribute to the broader concepts of debate, um, because we have um, some sort of normalisation of a higher level of exposure to education and thinking. Yeah. Um, oh, oh I, I'm, I'm completely happy with the majority of the population uh, going to university to at least 21. I'm, I'm very happy with that idea because it's... Uh, Regardless of subject? Um, I, I would, my, 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 what I like is a standard European university, which is a pretty rundown building, say in a German or a French or a Swiss town, concrete and not good looking. Um, but where the academic, where most of the young people who go to university come from that town, say Cone, Cologne, or, you know, um, where the academics own children go to the same university. Now the quality of teaching in those universities is incredibly good, um, partly because you're teaching your children's friends, you know, you, you, and, and also because you choose as an academic whether to teach master's students or PhDs and you're not paid anything extra for doing it. You only do it if you want to. Your department doesn't get any money either. And the difference between that, and we used to have this in Britain, only teaching at the master's and PhD level if you wanted to and not for money and your business model changing to you must run master's uh, is yeah it has an awful effect on what on what an education is um, but, but coming back to so your question about what people study um, I I don't see a problem with the continental European system where people do get more choice over what they study it varies a lot. There's, there are brutal versions in Italy where thousands of people can take the first year exams in medicine 
and 95% of them have failed. They try again and again. Um, but on the other hand, there's, there's an argument that says that that's a bit fairer than whether you can get into medicine depending on who your parents were when you were younger. Um, but I, I dislike the direction in which we're taking in Britain, mm. which is Most... where every, every university claims to be in the top 10 in one way or another. <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly in terms of fees. No, I was thinking Southampton has two universities, um, one of which has been a university for a very long time, and one of which was didn't even go via being a polytechnic. It went straight from being an institute of higher education yeah. uh, to a university. And when fees came in, they <coughs> felt they had to charge the same fees as everybody else. And they do have a very good reputation mm in a small number of subject areas. Yes. But they also have degrees in things like hairdressing and makeup and yeah. stuff like that. And you think, in fact, as I understand from people who work there, uh, they keep trying to float these things and the which, whoever is the guarantor of academic standards says, don't be silly, you can't have a degree in that. Yeah. And you think, is that the best way to teach a vocational subject that it, that does not require a level of academic rigor? I mean, I think nursing is recognised as an academic sub, as as a vocational subject that requires some academic rigor yeah. in it. Um, some of the others thing, some of the sort of more well, extremely marginal cases. Um, yeah. I, uh, how well served are those youngsters taking it's on tricky. that level of debt? I, I agree. It's well, the debts are, and the debt is worse for nurses than everybody else. So the horrible yeah. thing is, nurses trickle pay at their salary, so they 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 never pay it off. But by thirty years, they've paid more than a banker for their nursing degree. Paramedics, you know, to work in an ambulance, you now have to get this enormous debt that you'll pay back as an ambulance worker. Um, but uh, my, my sort of serious answer to your question is, why on earth do we let people do geography at universities? Now, which is my subject, so I'm now from a kind of professor of geography. Most of the world doesn't. Geography degrees do not exist in other countries. They only exist in one in 10 American universities. It's a colonial thing. There, there's some in Australia, some in Hong Kong and so on, whereas we have 60 or 80 departments in Britain. We created geography uh, because it teaches you how to become a colonial officer. That, that was why my department was created. Um, there's a letter in the time saying, please help fund this department. We need men to run the colonies. Um, and you look at something like geography and it's a very odd little, you know, why are we teaching people about volcanoes and wind and city structures and so on? But it doesn't do people great damage. And I could, you know, my colleagues will tell you about the wonderful advantages of it. But essentially, you don't question geography because it's established and British and for some time. The hairdressing, I could see extending <laughs> into general well-being. Um, it is essentially, I don't know if you remember the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, there was that ship uh, for the hairdressers. The ship, yeah. That, the ship for the ones who weren't needed. But hairdressing is, is part of those set of things. It, it, it's the preening that chimpanzees do. You know, it's a very basic, you know, part of being a human, which you'll notice when you, when we missed and started trying to cut our own hair. Um, I, I was talking to somebody about schools today, sorry to waffle on, and saying we only really notice what schools really did, their real value, which is social and so much wider, when we shut them. Um, it wasn't just about education. And I would say the same about hairdressers, because hairdressers in the future, if you think, if we have a a, a nice society in which most of us could be in leisure for a lot of our life in which I don't have to retire at 70 you know I might be allowed to retire at 65 the hairdresser could be one of the few people I actually see every you know so it could be a much wider thing or put it a last way in Finland if you're going to look after a three-year-old child or a two-year-old child in the kindergarten you have to have a master's degree the first degree isn't good enough because the care of two and three year olds is seen as so important and child development is seen as so important that the nursery nurse must have a master's degree. Now contrast that with what we think is, should happen in this country and what we pay and who looks after our two and three year olds. And you can see how things change. So I, I would be open, um, open to it, but 
the, the, the thing that annoys me, I, I grew up in Oxford in this town, and we used to have a local university where local people went to if they didn't get free A's. You know, you got BBC or whatever, but you went to Oxford Poly, and it included some courses about building and so on. We now have Oxford Brooks, and I, you know, I'm going to go because my university has all its problems. But the student, you need three A's or two A's and a A star to get in. There is no university in Oxford or Oxfordshire for the children of Oxford. You've got to go away from home. Mm. And that isn't the case in Southampton or Sheffield or Newcastle. Um, and, it, and it is part of the problem of too much elitism, I'd say, in and the selling of a name of a place. Mm. Um, yeah. Are you, are you making a division here between uh, vocational education and um, stretching the mind and building the basis of uh, knowledge and thought um, for an instrument in the future? You know, you, you, you're, you're a geographer um, uh, through some sort of derivation, and it seems to me that geography has hit um, my life a number of times. When I took O-levels in 1954, um, I took geography O level. And of all the O levels I took, I think I have about 13 or 14 or 15 O levels yes. before I got any A levels and so on. Of all the O levels I took, I would rate geography as the highest uh, valued study that I undertook at that time, even though yes. I became a mathematician. Yes. And the, my geography master taught me to research things and to express myself um in those things i'd researched uh, and, that, and, that, and that's great and, it, and you had a and you had a good teacher which is almost always a thing with geography when people i had a brilliant teacher at school which is why i went my, become a geography teacher but geography originally was a practical subject it, becoming a clonal officer required that you understood how rivers work and, and so on because you're going to be put in charge of parts of nigeria next to my department in in oxford next to what is now admittedly the new geography building is the forestry department where people learned how to be foresters at Oxford University. Next to that is medicine, you know, which is vocational, but was still a degree at the University of Oxford. We at one point had social work at the University of Oxford. Um, I would mix these things around. I think you, you want social workers, some social workers who know that somebody who does PPE isn't necessarily a genius and isn't completely intimidated by, by them, uh, and to have a mix uh, of, of things. So I, would, I would try and blur the academic vocational mix a little bit. And in the way we do that in geography uh, in, in, in many universities, because we teach something called GIS, which is Geographic Information Science, which is essentially how to use software that draws maps so that you can get a job, <laughs> you know? So, so it's... I, I, it's how do you what do you do when the majority of young people go to university what does the university become and what is it that you create that takes the place of what the university was and you said you've got somebody from max planck institution coming to speak to you in a way the max planks are sort of in some sense the universities of the future um and you can look at some of the plans for my well not plans but the trend in which my university is going only a minority of our students are undergraduates. So you could, you could see, but this is all mixed up with elitism and so on, mm -hmm. some universities heading towards being research only, age 21 above only. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure what the best um, mix of things is. Yeah, I've kind of leap forward a little bit. My experience at the end of the 1970s and the early 1980s was to be involved in some of the earliest introductions of graphics and colour into computer presentations. Yes. Um, one of the best exponents we had who could explain what had to be done, who could understand the requirements, happened to be a geography graduate. Yes. Yes. And I suspect that it's back to the fact that the discipline of his learning was separated from his eventual vocation. He yes. proved his abilities and then moved on. We now try to have vocational qualifications where, in theory, you can go and earn the world in a week because you got this piece of paper from, from Academy. Oh, I, 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 I do agree. We have, we have huge problems. Uh, or I do a re really kind of... My very short summary of education in Britain is uh, 
there's a terrible pro- that which you pay for you always pass uh, and so if you if you if you pay for the school education you will always get high grades the more you pay say master's education which you have to pay and it's it's the old argument on the health service which, which sort of says why do you want to keep it state funded it's to stop corruption um and in a sense with education in britain we have gone down the way of a privatized health service and it isn't necessarily and it's out of kilter nowhere in the rest of europe has the extent of privatization that we have either our universities or our schools uh, and it it doesn't help us in general um so so when you measure our ability against young people in other european countries it's not just that they can speak more languages they're better at maths than we are um and you got and it's partly because we're so geared to passing exams, partly because there's a market in it. So we, we train young people to get C's or A's on particular days, because that's what you're buying. And, and that has a terrible long-term um, effect. But, but wouldn't it be just wonderful if you could just train people to think uh, rationally, to debate uh, fervently and to apply themselves to the problems we face today. And John, can I yeah. cut you off there? Because time is going on. There are a couple of people who've been asking questions in the chat and they haven't had a chance to get in. Yeah. Are you okay? Just, just take a couple more questions quickly, Danny. I'll do a take a more quickly. You've got to remember the toilet yeah. behind me. So you do yes, that. it's great to talk um, about that, Don, though. Yeah. Um, so, Bob, very quickly, uh, you had a question on whether you've done any studies on the growth of energy use and electricity in particular. Uh, no, I will admit, uh, I do think I've done gas and coal and so on, so the sources, uh, because you've got a good data set on that. And there's a spreadsheet, there's, like, there's a website for the book, completely free. Just Google slow down Danny Dawling. And I've put all the spreadsheets up there if anybody's interested. And we have the gas, electric, and so on uh, trends. Along with there. links to a number of different online booksellers. So there you go. Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> terribly, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, finally, Christine, which seems to be uh, quite sort of on your topic, uh, saying thanks for a fascinating talk. What do your graphs show about inequality trends? In uh, this particular book, they show very little because you, you need to have more than one line to look at inequalities and see how much those two lines are diverging. And I tried to only have one line per graph. Uh, in the UK at the moment, we have had a pretty constant and high level of inequality for 24 years, income inequality. Uh, the pandemic has widened it uh, slightly. And it is, I think, as I sort of mentioned briefly in the talk, we now have the highest income inequality levels uh, in almost all of Europe. So we are a really outlier um, country. And that, if it hadn't been for Brexit and the pandemic and so, so on, I think inequality would have raised up the agenda and might at some point. But we've become, we've become almost used to it because 24 years of high income inequality and I got to say, without, this takes you right back into the middle of new labour, with not one year when the reduction in inequality was, signif was statistically significant. And it's absolutely depressing uh, to look at that, that time series. And this affects lots of trends for Britain. The world as a whole may be becoming slightly more equal, but in Britain we're not. And so our young people are looking at a future where if they do not get into the top 7% of society, then they will not get to share the third of income that that top 7% have. And that's an awful thing to set them up for. Um, so, you know, it's something we really need to do something about because it, it means you end up going to university and picking degrees, which you think are going to make you safer and the most amount of money rather than just going because you are fascinated by something and it doesn't really matter what you do because nobody ends up that badly paid later uh, and that produces a much better environment Danny, i think sorry we're going to shut that shut it off there because i'm, I'm conscious we're running over time now and um as, as Danny says, there's only one lavatory in his house and that's <laughs> behind him. So the discussion could have gone on potentially for a great deal longer. It's a very interesting subject. Um, 
do encourage people to get Danny's book. I have read nearly all of it by now. Um, it's an uh, excellent read. And um, we will be back next month uh, with a talk on the hydrogen economy from Professor Zoe Robinson at Kiel University. Danny, many thanks again. Thanks ever so much okay. for having me. Lovely to talk. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. Thank you very much. That was great.